Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Alicia Kallenbach, and I work for Talking Talons Youth Leadership. And we are very excited to be here today to share this information with you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen at this point because I have prepared a lovely PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and hit share. OK. So we're going to be talking about let's get outdoors today. So outdoors is the theme. And this is all funded by Bernalillo County Open Space. And as I mentioned earlier, um, I work for Talking Talons Youth Leadership. I am an environmental educator and grant writer here. Um, we are a nonprofit organization located up in Cedar Crest, which is up in the East Mountains. And we are most well known for bringing animals into classrooms, um, into like APS classrooms with kids and then taking kids on field trips to explore in the forest. And we've even done summer camps and just with the general theme of um, getting everyone excited about wildlife and conservation and protecting our beautiful planet. So let's go ahead. I'm going to, let's see, to the next slide here. So as I just mentioned, so why we are here is we are getting outdoors and in nature. So the presentation today is gonna to be broken up into two different parts. So we're gonna be learning about how to prepare for a family hike and also learning about the different open space trails that are available. And then after the, the, the halfway point of our presentation, I will introduce you to our live non-releasable wildlife snake friends. And I would like to make a note um, just because we do live in New Mexico where we have lots of different cultures and peoples, we always want to be very sensitive to everyone's different cultures. Um, so some cultures are sensitive to certain species of animals like snakes and owls. And so if that is you, um, this is just a little heads up and I, I will state this again right before I take out the live animals that um, we will be seeing two live non-venomous snakes today. So. Um, this kind of gave the surprise away a little bit, but just to, to let people know that's what will be happening. And I know some people are a little, get a little bit scared, you know, around snakes, that's a common thing, but we're hoping that, that we can um, help um, you maybe hopefully fall in love with them and be a little less scared of these guys. They really are really amazing creatures. And lastly, again, um, it is a big thank you to Bernalillo County Open Space for allowing us to be here today. They are our funders for this grant and we are so excited to be here. All right, so let's get started. So let's talk about what we should wear when we go outdoors. So specifically thinking about if we're gonna go out hiking on a trail. So first thing to do is wear comfortable clothes. So I would think of things like workout clothes, things you can move in that are um, breathable and just, just generally comfortable, not restraining in any way. And then also dressing in layers is a very good idea. You never know what the weather is going to be. You know, you could walk out one morning and it's, you know, um, sunshine or it's raining and then it might be the opposite in the afternoon, especially here in New Mexico. So wearing um, either a light or medium jacket or sweaters is a really good idea so you can put on or take off layers as needed. And wearing pants is a really good idea. So th this way you can protect your legs when you're, you're hiking and there might be some you know, thorns or branches in your path and it's just a good idea. I know it can be hot sometimes, but definitely we always wanna um, protect ourselves, right? And definitely you wanna wear good shoes. So no flip flops, no fancy shoes. Um, so you, a good rule of thumb is wearing closed toed shoes. So this is things like sneakers, tennis shoes, and especially hiking boots like this picture right down here in the, the bottom center would be a really good option. And then a hat and sunglasses as well, definitely to protect yourself from the sun and a face mask, just because we do have to keep our, our COVID safety in mind as well. All right, so moving on. So now we know what we're gonna be wearing as we're going outside. So what should we bring with us if we're going on a family hike? Well, first of all, we have to have something to put everything in. So definitely bringing a backpack. So you're gonna pack a backpack. Uh, most importantly, water bottle. 
you definitely want to have water when you're hiking. You're going to get thirsty. You're going to be sweating and be getting dehydrated. So even multiple water bottles, depending on how long you're planning on being out. And bringing snacks and a lunch is also a great idea. Um, some healthy snacks like fruit or nuts, um, you know, like granola bars are really great options. And if you're going to be out for the majority of the day, even packing yourself a lunch um, in a lunchbox with a with an ice um, cooler in there would be a really good idea. And also bringing your phone and camera. So the phone, just in case an emergency does happen, it's, it's really good to be able to call someone in case of emergency. And then also you can have a camera on your phone. If you do, then you can take pictures. If not, then you can um, just bring a camera along with you as well to capture your, your memorable hike. Also bringing a rain poncho is a good idea. So this is what um, they look like down here in this bottom middle photo. And also bringing a map. So this could even include taking a picture of the sign, but right before you, um, at the trailhead or before you walk out and start your hike. So just knowing where you're going, how long you're gonna be hiking for, how many miles it is, just in case you do happen to get lost, um, knowing where you are and seeing how to get back is really, really good idea. Having binoculars on you is also a really um, awesome thing to do. If you would like to look at the birds or wildlife and all sorts of different um, things around you. So binoculars are a really awesome thing to pack as well. Having a compass and whistle are also more on that safety side of things. So a compass, so you can know where you're going or if you happen to get um, you know, off the trail by chance, then you can, can figure out how to get back. And then a whistle, just in case there is an emergency situation, you can call for help. And lastly, a flashlight. You might not be planning on staying um, past, you know, in the sunset, but if something does happen unexpected, it is always a good idea. Or if you do plan on staying out past dark, um, having a flashlight is a really great idea. So you can see where you're going. All right, so these are more protection items. So you want to always protect yourself and others. So safety first, right? So a first aid kit. In the case that something does happen, you fall down, you know, you scratch your knee, you want to at least have some, some antiseptic and some band-aids to put on that and everything else that comes in our, our standard first aid kits. Also having hand sanitizer is a great idea if you're going to be eating snacks or eating lunch. And again, just um, COVID rules as well. All that ties into um, having hand sanitizer handy. It's a great idea. Then sunscreen. So we definitely always want to protect our skin in New Mexico. We are one of the top states for, for high rates of skin cancer. So sunscreen is really important, along with your hat and sunglasses that we mentioned earlier. And also insect repellent, especially if you're out during summer, you might come into contact with some mosquitoes. So you definitely don't want to be bitten up to where you're going to be scratching for the next couple of days with those painful bites. And then definitely looking for a natural bug repellent is best instead of the ones that have the harsh chemicals. It's, it's better for you and your skin and better for the environment. And also this is optional, but if you are gonna be going somewhere where you know there are bears around, bringing some bear mace spray might not be a bad idea if you do happen to encounter a bear, which is rather rare, I will say, but just in case um, that is a option for you. All right, so now we know what we're wearing and what we're packing and our safety items. So let's talk about where are we going to go? So there are lots of different options that the different Bernalillo County open space trails that you can see here, we have a, a map of these different areas. You can actually go to their website or just type in Bernalillo County open space into Google and then it'll bring you here. These areas where you can look at the pictures, you can explore, you can look up the different rules and hours, um, which also may have changed because of COVID. So it's always good to look up this stuff before you go. And so now we're just gonna talk about some, uh, a handful of some of these different sites that we thought um, you guys would enjoy going to that would be exciting and fun and, and scenic. Um, we can't talk about all of them just because we don't have time, but we, are, we will mention a handful. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is the Teharis Creek Remediation Project site. So this is located up in the East Mountains. Um, this is up in Cedar Crest. So it is right across from A. Montoya Middle School. So um, there's the middle school, then there's a big parking lot, and then this is right on the other side of that. So here they have actually created a bunch of surge pools that, so when it rains and there's all that storm water runoff from the parking lot and all the, the car oil and pollutants 
um, wash into this area, they actually um, fill up these pools and the different pools will fill up depending on how much water there is. So if it rains a lot, then all the pools will fill up. And this helps filter the water before it gets um, down into the river and then um, has to be you know, eventually filtered for our drinking water. So the trees are actually, this is like a natural filtration system. So really awesome spot. There's some really awesome trails that you can go on around here and it's really pretty during the fall too. So definitely recommend this spot. So next, another area that you can visit, another open space is Ojito de San Antonio. So this is also up in Cedar Crest, um, not too far away from the previous one. And here there's just a, it's a beautiful area. They, they have lots of different trails. There's a, I think a couple of different loop trails that you can go on. And they even have an orchard here. So they, there are trees that do produce fruit. So you can, um, if you do see a tree that does have ripe fruit on it, I would say that you can pick one to have for yourself. So maybe a rule of thumb is keep, just pick one for each person. So you definitely don't wanna take all the fruit off and, and hoard it. You wanna leave it so that everybody can enjoy. You know, someone else comes along and maybe they forgot a snack. Well, they can have a, a little peach off the tree. Um, I forget exactly which it might be, um, apricots, but what have you. But yeah, so, and also the wildlife eat the fruit on the trees as well. So we definitely, want to keep some for them. So it is their home too. So we want to respect and leave some food for them. And there's also bears. This is one of those sites that bears do come out when it's during bear season. I believe they do actually close this site for a couple of months during the, the height of when the bears are really active. And this is when the bears are actually going to be out and they are going to be enjoying some of the fruit off the trees as well. So it's a really awesome site. Lots of different cool plants and animals to see and lots of different cacti. So also um, highly recommend this one. So next is Carlito Springs. So also up in the East Mountains. I have personally not been to this site, but I have heard many, many good things about it. My coworkers both rant and rave about how amazing it is. And I already can see from this picture, it already makes me want to go and check it out. And the only thing is it has been under renovation for the past couple of years, and it is scheduled to hopefully reopen within the next year or so. But this is a really awesome spot. They have a stream, they have some different little pools that you can see and also some really awesome trails that you can check out. And I believe they also have an orchard here as well and lots of history. Um, so another really beautiful spot to, to visit. All right, so the next one you can choose to go to is Bekeke Open Space. So this one, I believe, I'm gonna try and remember, I think it's on, is it L, or on Rio Grande? I believe that's where this one is. And um, really amazing space. I have been to this one before. Uh, before COVID, they would hold a lot of events here. They have this um, education center down here that um, it used to be weekly. They would hold family events here and you can actually reserve the space and really awesome trails. They, they're really close to a really big a bike trail that you can go on. Um, but I would definitely check to see, hopefully um, with COVID, they, they will maybe slowly be getting back to hosting events here. But again, that's something you want to, to check out the website and research and have the most up-to-date information. All right, so next we have the Gutierrez Hubble House that you can visit. So this is down on Isleta, on, um, I believe it's in the South Valley. So. This is a really awesome spot, a lot to offer here. So they have, you can just see from this one picture, this is a trail that you can take with it and see all these beautiful, amazing, mature uh, native cottonwood trees right next to the irrigation ditch here. And they also have a museum that you can go in and there are specified hours, again, may have changed because of COVID, um, but they have different exhibits that they, they have some that stay and some that they rotate and just a lot of amazing history to learn here. And they also have a medicinal, an edible garden, um, that they have an orchard here as well. And they even have a little area where they have some farm animals that you can go by on one of the trails to see. So definitely this one um, is a, a must see spot, but I, I highly recommend. All right, so that's our last example of place you can go. So now we're gonna switch over to talking about trail etiquette. So this is when you're actually out on the trail. So we're gonna talk about um, the outdoor manners, kind of how you're expected to behave. All right. 
So first, first things first, you know, safety. We always wanna keep this in mind and keep our COVID safe guidelines in mind. So I know you guys have probably have heard a lot of these before, but we do have to mention them again, just so we want to abide um, by the rules and the laws of our state, right? So if you're feeling sick, please stay home just so you don't um, get anyone else sick. And if you're feeling COVID symptoms, getting tested. Um, so wearing a mask when you're near other hikers. So as we're all, pretty much used to at this point. So you can bring your mask with you. And if you happen to be, you know, way out in a space where you, there's really no one else around you and you're just with your, your family unit or whoever you, you live with, you can take it off. But if you are gonna be passing someone, um, definitely have that, that mask on um, so that you are being respectful and you are, um, you know, keeping yourself safe and others safe as well. So definitely limit your group size. So always check on the latest uh, CDC guidelines and recommendations to, to see what that group number is that you're allowed to be in outdoors. So I think it's usually around six or 10 people, but um, you know that, that always is a, a changing number there. And then definitely have a plan B in mind. If you're plan A trail, you find, you know, maybe the parking lot is filled up, there's just a ton of people there. Um, I would recommend, um, you know, having a backup place to go to that maybe is one that's kind of close to one of the other ones you're planning to go to just in case um, something happens where you cannot go to your first one. And then be prepared for restrooms and facilities to be closed. So definitely because of COVID, they do not have a lot of people working here that would normally maintain the, the restrooms and facilities. And some of these places just don't have these to begin with. So definitely use the restroom before you leave. So don't end up in that, that situation, right? So. Make sure you're ready to go. Already went to the restroom before you, you get into the car to go to one of these places. And lastly, as we all are pretty familiar with at this point where you're gonna maintain our six feet social distance between you and the other hikers. So if someone's coming by, getting off the trail to allow them to pass. And again, um, keeping safety in mind so that everyone um, stays safe. All right, so let's talk about, so the leave no trace principle. Some of you may have heard of this before. So prepare. So as I think I mentioned a couple of times before, so it's know before you go. So research the site and the rules in advance. Some places allow certain things, some don't. Um, you want to know these things before you arrive there and so that everything can go smoothly. And definitely be, be mindful and stay on the designated trails to reduce soil erosion and minimize disturbances to plants and wildlife. So if you do, like I mentioned, have to step off the trail to let another group pass, kind of look where you're stepping and maybe try and step on a rock or some dirt instead of crushing those, those little plants or little insects that might be around there because it is their home too and we wanna be respectful of them. Trash, so pack out all of your trash. Anything you go in with, you are coming right back out with. I'd recommend just having a bag that all your trash goes in. And then it's also a good idea just to leave the site uh, better than how you found it. So if you do see a piece of trash that someone accidentally left before you, just go ahead and pick that up, just put it in your trash bag, and then the next person will be able to enjoy you know, a, a cleaner, happier environment, just like you don't want to see people ahead of you leaving trash everywhere. So I do this, I pick up pieces of trash that I see that someone you know, may have blown out of a trash can or what have you, and it's just um, doing our part as stewards of the environment. Mother Nature will thank us. All right, so if you are bringing your dog with you, definitely always pick up your dog's waist. So there is no poop fairy, that is you. So you bring those little, you know, the dog baggies to clean up the poop and then always keep them on their leash. So we definitely wanna to remain to, to be respectful to other hikers and then just keeping COVID in mind as well. We wanna always have our dogs on their leashes. All right, so continuing on. So awareness, so take only photos leave only footprints. This is the principle behind the leave no trace. So allow others to enjoy it as well. So again, if you see trash, pick it up and just try and leave it exactly as we found it. So safety, safety is always very important. So be careful where you're stepping. So watch where you're walking. And this is gonna help reduce the possibility for you hurting yourself. So no twisted ankles or falling down and, and breaking wrists and scratching up um, hands and stuff. So always just take it slow and, and watch where you're going and you should be able to avoid injury, which we all would like to do. 
All right, wildlife. So definitely always give wild animals their space. So please do not scare, chase, or catch wild animals. So this thing, this I'm talking about lizards and little, you know, rodents you might see, even snakes and bugs. This is their home, so we're coming into where they are living. So we always want to remain respectful of them. And um, just think about if you were them and there's a creature, you know, 10 times bigger coming after you, they're, they're gonna think that, you know, you're trying to hurt them. So they might react accordingly. So we definitely just wanna appreciate them. You can take pictures and look with your binoculars, but let's try not to, um, you know, provoke any of the wild animals. So again, kind of the same theme. So respecting wildlife, respecting other trail users as well. So you can, again, pass if another group comes by and then just keep, also keeping the noise down is a really good idea and the wildlife appreciate this as well. Uh, you might be surprised if you take your, your headphones out and just try and have the whole family just maybe for a minute, you can set a timer on a phone, just listen and you can even turn it into a game and count how many nature sounds that, that you can hear. You might be surprised on how many different natural noises there are out there and it can be really relaxing too. All right, so lastly, just a notice, there are no motorized vehicles allowed on or off any of these trails. So they are meant uh, predominantly for, you know, hiking, um, people hiking or walking. And then some of them do allow bikes. And then I think some of them also allow horses. But again, that's something to look up in the rules before you go, just to see what, what's allowed and what's not. All right, so jumping into some animals that we may encounter. So we just talked about wildlife, right? And seeing the different animals that we come across when we're hiking. So snakes are one of these animals and they do live in our state. We do have many different kinds of them. So this, this is some examples of the non-venomous snakes that we have. So just to go through some of them, there's lots of different colors and sizes and shapes, but we have the bull snake, we have the milk snake, gopher snake, lots of different species of garter snake. We have our Western coach whip, we have hog noses, we have desert king snakes, and even corn snakes and water snakes in our state. So you may be coming across some of these guys as you are hiking. So we do have some tips, so some prevention tips for living near in and around snakes. So um, definitely, as we mentioned before, with the, the other wildlife, definitely do not try and tease, catch, or handle any snake in the wild. They're most likely going to react by trying to, to bite you in defense because they think that, you know, your hand coming down kind of looks like a big eagle claw. So they think they're being turned into prey. So usually snakes are not going to want to bother humans unless they feel threatened. So again, if you're coming up to them, you're trying to, to handle them or, or um, startle them, then they're gonna react. So do not put your hands or feet in between rock crevices or animal holes. This is a great way to get bit and we want to avoid doing that. So definitely um, no hands into places that you can't see what's inside. And um, just be mindful of where you're stepping. Again, there might be a snake on the actual trail. So just just being mindful and being aware of what's around you is a really good way um, to be safe. But if you do happen to see a venomous snake, the first thing to do is be still and quiet. So you're gonna wanna, um, if you hear it before you see it, definitely freeze and locate where it's coming from. Now, if you've located it, it you would like, it, the best thing to do is to walk backwards away from it slowly um, until you're in safe distance to turn around and then either walk away or find an alternate route around the snakes. You just want to calmly, you know, give them their space and then go around them is the best um, method of, uh, to take in this case. All right, so these here are the venomous snakes that we have in New Mexico. So there are lots of different species. We have many, many different types of rattlesnakes. So you can see all of these guys. And then we also have the coral snake as well. So as you can see, these guys are actually, they're not all really brightly colored with the exception of the coral snakes. So they're actually pretty good at blending in. They have some pretty good camouflage on these guys. So again, this is why it's so important to watch where you're stepping and you're walking just so you can avoid being bitten by a snake. 
But if it does happen, which it does to a certain number of people every year, um, we're just gonna quickly go over what some first aid steps to take would be. So if you do, this is specifically if you get bit by a venomous snake, which becomes a medical emergency. So number one thing to do is try as best as you can to remain calm. And you wanna put, again, a safe distance between you and the snake. And then just one note is just, it would definitely be a stressful situation, but maybe someone else that you're with could try and memorize what the snake looks like because they are gonna need this information when you're taken to the hospital to get you the correct anti-venom. This becomes important later. So definitely have just a brief description to be able to tell the, the people in the ambulance. <clears throat> so definitely um, if that happens to you, you want you yourself or a family member, you want to call 911 immediately for a ambulance to come get you to transport you to a medical facility. And as I mentioned, anti-venom is the only effective treatment in this case for a venomous snake bite. <clears throat> so while you're waiting for the ambulance to come get you, in the meantime, you can call the New Mexico Poison Control Center. This is the number listed here and they will walk you through exactly what you need to do in the meantime. So you also want to remove any jewelry or other restrictive items around the, the bite. And then over here is the hotline again for the Poison Center. Um, and this is again why it's important to carry your cell phone on you if you were to have an emergency. Here's their website as well, so the UNM uh, Poison Center. And lastly, what not to do. So there's a lot of movies out there, a lot of false information, a lot of myths and stuff that we can come across. So definitely not applying a tight tourniquet. So, you know, see in the movies, they take their belt off and they, they try and, you know, cut the circulation off. So just do not do that. Do not apply ice either. So these things can actually not only not help, they might even hurt and cause more tissue damage. And again, another one that I forgot to put on here was do not try and suck the venom out of the wound. I know that's a popular thing in movies. As we all should know by now, the things that we see in movies are not always real. So that, that can uh, be very harmful to the person that tries to suck the venom out themselves if they have any micro cuts in their mouth, things you sometimes you aren't even aware that you have a small injury in your mouth. If that gets into their bloodstream, then they are in a medical emergency as well as well as the person that already got bit. So then you have two people in the situation. So just not a good idea. Call the poison control center. They will tell you what to do. Call 911, 911 first, then the control center. And they will get you over to the hospital so that you can be saved if this happens to you. Hopefully this does not happen to any of you, but uh, good information to know if, if that does. All right, so this concludes my PowerPoint that I have. So it looks like, okay, awesome. So it automatically stopped sharing the screen. So at this point, I am gonna go ahead and introduce you guys to my snake friends that I mentioned earlier. And so this is the, the moment where anyone who has any cultural sensitivities to snakes or you just don't feel comfortable, we're not forcing anyone to do anything they're not comfortable with. If you would rather not see a live snake today, that's okay too. Um, so thank you for, for coming this far um, through the presentation. But um, at this point, I will um, take, um, it'll take me just a second to get out my first friend. Um, just before I do take them out though, so they are both non-venomous constrictors. So here at Talking Talons, we would not have venomous snakes. We would not be handling venomous snakes. Um, and yeah, so I have, I have two of them to show you. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab my first friend. So give me just one second and I will be right back. Hey, Alicia, uh -huh. um, before, uh, or before you really get started sharing about the snakes, if you could make sure that you are in speaker view for the camera so that your camera will show up the biggest. Oh, um, let me see speaker view. 
you. Okay, speaker. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, everybody. Let's have you say hello to Soy, our milk snake. So you guys did see a picture of not her specifically, but her species on the slide on the non venomous um, slide there previously. And I just want to make sure open. Of course, I can't use the, um, <laughs> the computer with my gloves on. Um, so Soy here is a, as I mentioned, a Pueblin milk snake. And she is actually a native species to uh, New Mexico. So you, um, as we mentioned, we can come across her as you are out and about and hiking. And she is about eight years old now. And milk snakes can live up to 20 years old. So she still has quite a bit of life to live. And she, let's see if I can stretch her out for you so you can see just how long she is. Snakes do like to be curled up um, because they feel safer that way. It's their, you know, they don't have hands or feet. So the best they can do is curl around things. And so she, so they can actually get up to four feet long. So as you saw, she's maybe about three or so. So she still has some growing to do. And you can see that she is flicking her tongue out. So I'm going to try and bring her up as close as I can to the, the camera there. And so snakes actually sense the air by using their tongues. So they're smelling the air. Um, so they, their tongues work differently than humans. So you can think about their tongue as kind of like one of those lint rollers that um, you, know, you use for your animal hair. They they will pick up the, the chemicals and molecules in the air around them. And then it goes up into a slot in the roof of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ. And their brain is actually gonna read what they're smelling. So it's pretty cool. Um, so milk snakes are nocturnal. Nocturnal means that they are active at night. So she usually sleeps during the day and is active at night. So opposite of humans and she, they, they called them, we'll go into the myth about um, how milk snakes got their, their name. So there's an old wives tale of, um, you know, people would find these snakes in a lot of times in barns and they're thinking, oh, you know, the snakes are, are drinking the cow's milk. Well, that's actually not the case. Some of you may know that the snakes, um, they do not do this. They don't, um, get up there and, and drink cow's milk. They actually are um, carnivores. So they are gonna be eating all the rodents and different animals that are living in the barn there. So, you know, of course, mice and rats, you're gonna find lots of those inside of a barn. That's what these snakes are in there eating. And milk snakes specifically are what's known as king snakes. So they actually will even eat other snakes. So they are not picky. Um, they will go again, you know, a lot of snakes will like to, to eat rodents like mice and rats and, and lizards even, but these, these milk snakes will even go after other snakes. They'll eat bird eggs. They'll even eat frogs, um, you know, anything. I think they even can climb up and they, they might get a bat if they're able to do that. Um, but they basically, they're known as opportunistic feeders or in other words, they are not picky eaters. They will, if it's moving and they think they can fit it in their mouth. They're gonna try and do that. And so another cool thing about snakes is they actually, so she can eat something that's as big around as the thickest part of her body. And, you're, and then you look at her head and you're like, wait a second, her head is way smaller. How is that even possible? And how do they even catch their prey to begin with? If it's a mouse scurrying around, they don't have arms or legs. So this is um, why the name constrictor comes into play. So they actually will, will sneak up on the animal and then they will strike and they'll wrap around it really, really quickly. And then they'll squeeze really hard, squeeze all the breath out. And then they will open their mouths and they actually can unhinge 
their jaws. So they will open and expand their mouths open. Their jaws will actually come detached from the bottom part um, of their mouth. And they can fit a really big mouse in a seemingly small head and jaw area. So really, really cool. They can eat things much larger um, than you may think. And so soy here is actually a mimic. So if you guys remember from the slide earlier, um, she is mimicking a snake that actually is venomous called the coral snake. So let me go ahead, I need to grab my, my little picture here for you guys. So we have, we look here, so we have soy, the milk snake on this side over here. I don't know if it's right or left on your guys' screen. So this side right here is our milk snake. And then this is the venomous coral snake on this side over here. So you can see that they are both uh, red, black, and yellow snakes. But the difference is in the pattern of their bands. So we have a fancy little rhyme to go along with um, if you do happen to come across one of these snakes in the wild and you don't know right away which one it is, you can remember that if red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. If red touches black, you're okay, Jack. So that means if the red band's touching the yellow band, like on the coral snake, that you're a dead fellow. And that means that's venomous. You get bit, that's a trip to the hospital. Um, but then the milk snake, if red touches black, you're okay, Jack, then you, you're it's still not fun to be bitten, but um, at least it's not gonna be a, a medical emergency in that case, right? So that is a way to be able to tell the difference between the non-venomous milk snake and the venomous coral snake. So why do we think that a snake like soy here would want to look like a venomous snake when she herself is not venomous? Well, it's actually because it helps her survive. So this is a um, something they've evolved to do to be able to not be eaten by predators. So if a predator comes up and they see her, and you know they might not think of the rhyme either. They just see a snake with these general colors. They're going to say, "Oh, that's the venomous one. I'm going to stay away." And uh, predators of these snakes are uh, commonly going to be like birds of prey are going to be going after them. So like big raptors, like hawks and falcons and owls and things like that. Um, so this actually helps protect her um, when it comes to predators. But sadly, it does backfire when it comes to one, um, one animal in particular. I just want to think for a second. What animal do we think that her looking like a venomous snake might backfire. That's actually human, so believe it or not. Um, sadly, you know, if people are out on the trail and they're not educated like you guys are now, they might become really afraid. They might think, oh, that's a venomous snake. And sadly, their first instinct might be to harm and or even kill a snake like soy here. So we want to advise against that. And now definitely you know the difference. So if you see one of these guys, you can um, tell your friends or family, no way, that's that's a, a harmless milk snake. Let's, let's let them live. And even the venomous snakes, they deserve to live as well. If you do happen to have a, a venomous snake show up on your property or around where you are or what have you, there are numbers that you can call where they will come and safely remove the snake without hurting it. If it's like a rattlesnake, there's, um, you can just Google, you know, New Mexico rattlesnake removal number and uh, they will come in and, and get the snake, um, carefully put them into um, usually a, a pillowcase and then let them go out somewhere way far away from people where they can live their ha happy, healthy snake lives. So if we can count on you guys to help advocate for, for all snakes, the non-venomous and venomous, to be able to, um, to live their lives out just like ours. That would be amazing. So awesome guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch out snakes as I see that we have um, just about 15 so or minutes left. So I'm just gonna put Soy up here so you can say goodbye to her. So we'll say bye to Soy. You've been a, a very good, 
Good. Bye, Soy. Beautiful, beautiful snake. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and switch these guys out. So give me one more second. I will, I will return momentarily. Okay, so I guess in the meantime, if you guys can still hear me, so I'm just going to show you. So I was mentioning pillowcases earlier. So this is how we transport our snakes as well. So they're inside these pillowcases and they're inside boxes that they can, that have holes in them so they can breathe. And this is for their own safety. They can breathe just fine inside the pillowcases. And it's just that they're kind of kept dark. Um, you know, animals can get stressed out if they see everything that's going by and then they, snakes are really great escape artists. So this allows them to not, you know, be able to escape and then be in the car when we're transporting them and things like that. And then I am using hand sanitizer in between handling each snake. Again, just a good idea with the pandemic going on, but also snakes do carry a bacteria called salmonella. And this may or may not, may or may not be on them. It's just something that these animals can carry naturally. And so just to keep ourselves safe and going in between each animal, we always sanitize in between each one. And this also keeps our snakes healthy. If one snake were to be sick, we don't wanna pass it to the other snake. So that's another reason. All right, everyone, say hello to our exotic species. This is Rainy. As you can see, she is quite a bit bigger than Soy, our previous snake. And Rainy is actually not from around here. So that's why we, we call her. So, so native means, um, my hair is in my face. Um, so native is, lives naturally in the area and exotic means they were taken from somewhere else and placed here um, somewhere where they wouldn't naturally be. So Rainy is a Brazilian rainbow boa. So where do we think she's from if she's a Brazilian rainbow boa? If you guys said Brazil, you would be correct. She is, her species of snake is originally from the rainforest of Brazil. That's where you would find her. So she would normally be crawling up on a tree. So um, she is actually what we call a tree snake or arboreal snake, as opposed to soy. Previously, she was a terrestrial snake or um, ground snake is where you're gonna find her most of the time. And Rainy is actually, um, so, so oh wait, she's also nocturnal and she is about seven years old. So she's actually one year younger than soy, but much bigger. So it all depends on species, right? And she, so I'm gonna try and stretch her out for you. So she's a lot stronger than soy. So I'm gonna see if she's gonna, let's see if I can get her. So if I can get her in the whole picture here. So there she is mostly stretched out. So I'm seeing like three and a half, maybe even four feet. Um, these snakes can get up to six feet in length. So that is, really, really long and big that she can eventually grow to. And the really cool thing, oh, and then she also can live for 25 years or so. 20 to 25 years is the common um, lifespan for Brazilian rainbow boas in captivity. And that, that um, 
lifespan is lowered whenever they're in the wild. And that is just because of things like, you know, there's actually going to be predators where when they're in um, captivity, they're getting fed and watered and they're getting their, their correct amount of sunlight and they're being treated if they get sick. But in the wild, there's not any of that medical care that they get. So um, they can fall ill and, and then not make it and not live as long. And so a really awesome thing about Rainy and why they call them rainbow boas is that her scales actually have little microscopic ridges on them that reflect the sunlight in such a way, kind of like a spectrum, um, where they actually will look like little rainbows. And I have a picture because we're not in sunlight right now, but this is what it would look like if she were in sunlight. I'll hold that up there. So that is what her scales will do. The, the light will bounce off of them and she will become this very beautiful um, iridescent snake. And even her eye scales will even reflect the, the, the sunlight. So she, so speaking of scales, so snakes will shed their skin as some of you may have heard. So their skin is different from ours and how it grows. So they, um, when they get big, so when they, when they're eating food, you know, they're going to be growing and kind of like, you can think about it as clothes, you know, you outgrow some clothes that you don't fit in anymore as you got bigger, as you get older. Well, same thing with snakes when their skin you know, it gets really, really tight when it's too small for them to fit in anymore just because they've been eating and growing. Um, they, the top layer will actually um, become really dry and then eventually it will be time for it to come off and the snakes will know to start rubbing their heads along different things in their environment like rocks and, and branches and they will work off that shed so that it can reveal the, the, the under, the brand new scales that have been growing underneath. And so Rainy here is what's known as viviparous. Viviparous, that is a fancy word for she gives live birth to her young. So a lot of snakes, including our, our previous one, soy, are oviparous, which means they lay eggs. But uh, Rainy here will actually give birth to live little wiggling baby snakes. And when they are born, they're actually the size and shape of a pen or pencil about this big. So she definitely has grown a lot since she has been a baby. And snakes are also what we call ectothermic. So ectothermic means that they are cold-blooded, which means they have to absorb the heat from the environment around them. They're not capable of producing their own heat. Um, unlike humans, humans are what we call endothermic, where we can make our own heat. And so she does enjoy being wrapped around my nice warm arm. And when snakes get more, as they become more warm, they'll become more active because that means they have more energy. And I also do have another picture here. So going back to how snakes sense their world, um, they see, so they don't have the same eyesight as us. So they're, they're relying on that, that tongue to smell. Um, and then I did, I did forget to mention, so their tongue is forked so that they can tell which direction a smell is coming from. So if one of those, uh, you know, a smell of a mouse hits the right side of their tongue, they're going to head off to the right if they're hungry and they want to find a meal. Um, but their eyesight is a little bit different. They see in thermal um, vision. So they, they only see heat blobs. So this is what a mouse looks like to a snake. That's pretty cool. So the, the warmer um, the, the temperature, the more reddish orangish it is, and then the cooler, the more greenish or bluish. So, you know, the core of an animal's body is gonna be the warmest, like the brain and things like that. So this is how they would be seeing their world. So I'm just a big heat blob to rainy, which is pretty cool. So let's talk about a little, um, so I guess I didn't describe to you guys how these snakes came to be in Talking Talon's care. So they are both what we call non-releasable wildlife animals. So they cannot be released back into the wild, especially Rainy. This isn't her natural habitat. She would not be doing okay here in New Mexico. She needs humidity, very specific temperature. Um, but so they were originally purchased from pet stores 
by individuals in the community. And they decided that it's a big responsibility. It's, it's too much of a responsibility to take care of a snake. And they donated them to Talking Talons. So it is a big responsibility to take care of snakes. They require very specific care, depending on which species. Um, they need to be at a certain temperature when they're fed. Their cage needs to have certain heat lamps because they need to get certain um, you know, UV rays. And Rainy here even needs to have a humidity um, setting as well because she's from the rainforest where there's supposed to be a lot of rain, right? We're in New Mexico, not a lot of rain. So that her caretaker actually has to spray her down with water and keep that humidity level um, what, you know, at the correct um, amount for her to thrive at. So back in the, so how these guys actually entered into the pet trade, specifically the the Brazilian rainbow boas back in the 1980s. Um, so none of these snakes were, were pets back in the 80s. And then many of them were, were taken from the rainforest, from the wild, and then sold into the pet trade. And a lot of these guys did not make it, unfortunately, because it is very stressful for an animal, a perfectly healthy animal to be taken from the wild and then put into a, a cage if they don't have to be there. So a lot of them didn't make it. Again, the transport process, the stress, probably temperature differences. So a lot of them died, which is really sad. Um, Rainy was bred in captivity. So it's a little bit different now that some of them being bred, she wouldn't know. So once an animal, if an animal is born into captivity, they cannot be released into the wild because they did not develop any of those skills to you know avoid predators or find food on their own and that kind of stuff. So that is why they are ambassadors to their species and they're here to teach you guys about themselves, but they are not able to be released back into the wild for, for those reasons. And other reasons are, you know, animals get injured and that's, um, you know, other, a couple of different reasons why. Um, so anyway, going, going back to the story. So um, these guys were taken from the rainforest and they, so we were thinking about, you know, over there on what's going on in the rainforest. So there has been a lot of you know, fires in the past couple of years. I don't know if you guys have heard on the news, you know, the, the rainforest has had these massive fires that have been taking out a lot of the, the trees there. Well, the trees are really important for us to have. They're actually the, the lungs of our planet. They help purify our air. You know, they give off oxygen, which humans and animals breathe. So very important to, to have those trees there. And that's habitat for snakes like rainy. But um, I did read a statistic the other day that every second that goes by a football sized area of rainforest is cleared, or that means cut down um, by people, you know, for various reasons. Sometimes we do need certain things from the rainforest and wood, you know, paper and things like that, but that's at a really alarming rate, really much quicker than the rainforest can recover from. So we um, are asking you guys to, to help try and um, mitigate this and so that we can still have a rainforest, you know, in the next decade or a couple. And um, there are things you can do to help save the rainforest, such as, let me grab my little picture here. So just be mindful of what you're buying. So there, um, you know, you wanna think about where is it coming from and is it harming animals if I buy these certain things and Rainy is really wanting to come say hi as I'm trying to hold this up, yes, I know. You, know, you want to be over here by my core where I'm warm. And she's really heavy to hold up on, on one arm here. She has been growing and eating very well. But um, here's our little rainforest, rainforest Alliance frog that I wanted to show you guys. So if you're looking at products that you buy, like uh, coffee or um, paper products, anything that can come from the rainforest, um, you want to be looking out for this little frog symbol because this little um, Rainforest Alliance certification means that um, they have certified that this product is not hurting the rainforest or, you know, the animals that live there um, by, by harvesting this product. So it's things like they'll grow coffee in the shade of trees so they don't actually have to cut down the trees so that, I don't know if you've heard the term of the shade grown coffee, that's where that's coming from is they're trying to ensure that we still have, you know, a rainforest for future generations um, of humans and of course, for future generations of Brazilian rainbow boas so that they can actually have a habitat to live in. All right, so we're just gonna 
show Rainy off a little bit more here. I'm trying to think of any other points that I may have missed. Uh, Miss Rachel, you can feel free to jump in on any um, main points that I did not cover. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to show you the beautiful, lovely Rainy up close here. Yep, she likes the little green light that is on the computer there. So a question that I get a lot of times from classes that I present to is, do snakes have bones? So do you want to address that? Yes, that is a great question. So snakes do have bones. They, you can think about them as just a giant um, body with a ton of ribs. So they have a backbone just like us. So if you put your, I can't do it right now as I have, I need both hands for rainy, but if you put your hands behind on your neck and you feel those little bumps, that's your backbone. And so snakes have that all the way from their head down to the tip of their tail. And I'm trying to remember the number, I believe it is about 400 ribs, if I am correct. It has been a little while, but I believe it is around 400 ribs total that they have that goes throughout their entire body. And snakes have all the same organs as we do as well. So they have a brain, they have a stomach, they have lungs, um, they have you know, a bladder, um, and it's just all you know, elongated. It's all kind of stretched out to, to fit into their, their snake bodies. Um, I'm trying to, oh, and I know another question that we, we normally get is, how do we know if they are boys or girls? So the fun answer to that is we do not, we don't know for sure. We, uh, we, we sometimes choose our pronouns on, on what to refer to um, them for the day, but there is a procedure, a, a process that a veterinarian can do, but it's very invasive. It's very uncomfortable and stressful for the snake. They have to pry open scales and um, really not fun stuff. So we just choose to be happy and just and not knowing. And if one day one of them lays an egg, then we will know that they're a girl. And if they do not lay an egg, which they none of them have yet, um, then maybe they're just a girl that has not laid an egg or they are boys. And another cool fun fact is that in the reptile world, girls get bigger than boys. That is a common um, trend. So if you're reptile, if you're unsure um, and you have a really big reptile, like your snake is bigger than a lot of the other ones, then that's a good sign that it's probably a female. Rainy is pretty big, but I, I know it's all in comparison. So I'd have to, I would have to see a, another rainbow bow of the same age to really see you know, how big. And then of course, if they're eating more, they're gonna grow bigger and faster. So lots of different um, variables to that. So it's just a rule of thumb. And I'm another, I know another question I normally get is, does it hurt when she's wrapping around me? So no, not really. She's not squeezing me like if she were squeezing prey. She's just wrapping around to hold on. And it kind of feels like not maybe not even as tense, as intense as uh, the blood pressure cuff that the doctors, if you guys have ever been to the doctor, they put that blood pressure cuff on your arm and they pump it up, you know, that is similar to what it feels like, but usually not even as, um, as intense as when they first, you know, um, pump it all the way up. All right, well, I think we are at our time limit. So thank you all so much for, for joining me today to, to learn about how to prepare to uh, venture into the outdoors for an adventure and learning about um, our uh, open spaces and our snakes today. So I will, have Rainy say goodbye to everyone. Oh, well, there she is. One last little, little look there. Yes, you're Bye, right. Rainy. Bye, Rainy. You're a sweet girl. All right. So I think I'm going to go ahead and conclude this presentation. But um, whoever is watching, thank you again. It was really fun to, to share this information with you guys and uh, go forth and explore and um, teach others about what you learned and um, definitely respect and um, respect and protect our our wildlife. All right. All right, we're gonna hit, let's see.